What does God really want from you? How, how would you answer that question? What does God really, really want from you? What does he want from you, really? As a pastor, I've seen a lot of people try to answer that question in a lot of different ways. Uh, for example, uh, a, a lot of people, when, when they come to check out a church, maybe as an adult, they, they're a little hesitant because they think, oh, you know, God really wants my money because they talk about it all the time at church, asking for more and more money. Is that, is that what God wants from you? Now, other people uh, I've seen over the years of ministry that they think that God really wants them to be a good a good person, a good person, maybe a good citizen even. Uh, there are others, and maybe this is coming from the Bible or, or maybe their parents where they've drawn this conclusion. Some people think that God really wants them to be perfect, to be perfect. Uh, other people I've met over the years think that God really wants uh, them to not make him mad. <laughs> uh, others have said, well, what he really wants is me not to use his name in vain. Or others have concluded that God really wants me to not smoke or chew or go with girls who do. That happens sometimes as well. So how would you answer that question? How would you answer that question? What does God really want from you? Now, I don't know what your answer might be. It might be one of the things that I mentioned or something else altogether. But I would submit to you that I think the best way for us to find the answer to that question is to actually look at the one who answered it for us to see how God actually answers that question, what he really wants from us. And to do that, we have to head back to the Bible as we do every week here. And so I want to invite you, if you would, open your Bible or open your Bible app with me to Genesis chapter 4 for the fourth installment of the series that we have been calling Origin Stories. And we're doing this series because we recognize that everybody has a different story, a different way that they got to this place, but the reality of all of us is that we share a common origin account that there is a story that ties us all together. And we've been looking at it in the series. Uh, and while you're kind of getting there to Genesis chapter 4, let me just say uh, that the answer to this question, what does God really want from me, from you, is I think going to be a little bit strange. Uh, we're going to be looking at something together over the next 20, 25 minutes, I think that might shock you how God answers this question. And my prayer is, is that it will shock you in a way that you might find helpful. And so we're going to pick up the story. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 starts this way. Now Adam had sexual relations with his wife, Eve, and she became pregnant. Now, I just want to stop here just for a second because I think maybe Adam and Eve had to have wondered after the previous chapter, after Genesis chapter 3, after the fall, after their original sin, they had to begin to have wondered whether God's plan for them to populate the planet with people would still be in effect. Or if what they did was so bad, it was just going to be the two of them together until their deaths. And then one day, something strange began to happen. Eve started to feel a little bit nauseous one morning. She started to get a little bit moody. She started to experience some strange cravings. She started to want ice cream with pickles on it in the middle of the night. For some reason, it hadn't even been invented yet, but she started to want that. And all of these things were new to her because this has never happened before. There were no books about how to navigate this new process, and there was nobody else to even ask what was going to happen. And so Adam says to her, Eve, hey, honey, I don't know how to, I don't know how to put this, but are you putting on a little weight it looks like the garments that God made for you are getting a little tight around the tummy. What's the matter, Eve? Did I say something wrong? This might be the first place the first murder may have taken place, but it wasn't. Uh, we'll see that in a little bit later. But he was innocent. I mean, Adam had never seen this before. This was his first time here. He was going to say Something stupid. I'm so glad we learned from that as men and have never said anything stupid since. Like, I'm glad we're getting better. Uh, but he was right. Something was happening. Something different was occurring because she was pregnant. Look, look at the rest of verse 1. It says this. She became pregnant. And when she gave birth to Cain, she said, with the Lord's help, I have produced a man. With the Lord's help, I have produced a man. Now, I think Eve's response here is typical of women, even 
to this day because in the moment where they are giving birth, they, they mention God and Jesus a lot, uh, but really don't express much appreciation for their husbands at all. Uh, I don't know what's up with that. But anyway, so we see here that Adam and Eve are finally starting this family. But in this family, Cain is not going to be the only child. In verse 2 it says, Later she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. When they grew up, Cain and Abel, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the ground. So Cain's bro, Abel, comes along. And in this verse we get a glimpse of the kind of people that they are going to be. Abel is going to be a shepherd or a rancher and Cain is going to be this farmer. And this seems simple enough, right? But it's in the next few verses where this storyline starts to get a little more complex and a little more complicated. Look at verse 3 with me. Verse 3 says this. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. And so how does God respond to these gifts that are being given by Cain and Abel? Verse 4, the last part says, The Lord accepted Abel and his gift. Verse 5, But he did not accept Cain and his gift. And this made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. Now, I think this is very interesting because I look at this storyline and I'm like, what's, what's the problem here? And I'm sure Cain was asking the exact same thing. In fact, I guess he was asking this, the question we started with. God, God, what do you really want from me? What, what do you want from me here? I mean, didn't Cain give God what he wanted? I mean, why did his gift get shot blocked by God? Why wasn't it accepted? Well, the answer is simple. Cain completely missed the point of what it means to give a gift to God. Cain completely missed the fact that God is more concerned with how we bring something to him than he is with what we bring to him. Cain completely missed the point that it is the motivation behind the gift that matters the most. Let me show you what I mean by that. Uh, Take a look at Abel's gift, his offering, in verse 4. What does it say? It said, Abel also brought a gift, the what? The best, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. Now, the first thing I want you to notice here, and if you are an in-your-Bible writer, I want you to note or circle or underline or highlight the word firstborn because it's a crucial term in understanding what's happening here. Now, this word is significant in this story because it refers to a principle in the Bible that says that the firstborn should always belong to God. And some of you are like, sounds good to me. I will gladly give him my firstborn. Not a problem, right? Now, that's not what he's talking about. The principle is also sometimes called the law of the first fruits. And the idea behind this is that when the the first either agricultural or livestock, the first return of the year appears, the first fruits of the ground or a tree or the first calf to be born. When that happens, you essentially are saying, I'm going to give God that, that first fruit as a gift in order to make the statement that I trust that he will continue to provide for me. You see, doing this In this way says, I I won't wait to give to God until it's easy to give to God. Or I won't give out of my surplus after I know that I have enough for me. This first fruit idea is a bold act of faith that says, I believe God is going to take care of me. And in a world of scarcity, that's, that's not an easy thing to do. But this is the act that Abel does. This is exactly the act that Abel does. That, that's the first thing. The second thing I want to point out to you, and you can note this or circle or highlight or underline this one as well, is the phrase best portions, best portions. Uh, some of your versions might read fat portions, which in our world has a, a, a negative connotation. I mean, we assume that lean cuisine is more spiritual, much more spiritual, uh, or much more fancy than Applebee's bourbon's Street steak with an Oreo shake. Like, 
Like, that's the fat side. We want lean cuisine, right? Like, that's the way to go. But in Abel's day, the battle was against starvation. And the fat portions or the best portions were a term that were used to describe the most desirable part, the the most life-giving section of any edible animal. So what we see is that Abel had chosen to give God as an expression of how he felt about God, as an expression of his heart, that he chose to give God what cost him the most and what required the greatest trust from him. That was Abel. Now, by contrast, Cain, his offering appears to be quite casual. Look at what it says in verse 3. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented what? This is so crucial. Cain presented some, some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Now, this is a new sort of insight for me in the last couple of years. I'd never noticed this before, but did you see it? Circle, underline, highlight the word Some, because some here says that there really is no intentionality in what he's doing here. He's not giving God his best. Some, this word, says that there is no passion behind this gift. There is no appreciation behind this gift. There's no gratitude. There's no faith required in what he's giving to God. You see, what some really says is that when it comes to giving God, Cain's heart wasn't in it because Cain was content with just going through the motions of sacrifice. In other words, my insight from this over the last few years has been this, that the important thing wasn't what Abel and Cain gave to God with their hands, but rather what they came to God with in their hearts. You see, it doesn't matter what form the gift takes. It doesn't matter that, that Cain was a farmer and Abel was a shepherd. It doesn't matter what form the gift takes. It's the thing behind the thing that matters the most. You see, when we give to God, God is actually giving us an opportunity to see what's, what's really going on inside of our hearts. Because whatever's in our hearts will eventually show up in our hands. And so worship, what we offer to God, in our singing, in our giving, in our time, in our talent, all of these things, what we give to God, it exposes what we really feel about God. You see, the way we worship is our wake-up call to what's really going on inside, what's really going on in our hearts. And what we see going on in Cain's heart wasn't awesome at all. But look at verse 6. It says this. Why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain. Why why do you look so dejected? Verse 7. You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Because sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. But you must subdue it and be its master. So what we see is that Cain, at this point, could have done a heart check and recognize what was really going on in there. God is giving him an opportunity to look inside at what motivated his particular gift. I mean, this could have been Cain's wake-up call, and the story could have been entirely different. It would have been one about repentance and, 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 and turning around into a new way, but it wasn't. Look at what happened. Verse 8, it says this. One day, Cain suggested to his brother. Now, I want to say that this word brother that he used here, the writer here, is going to be used five times in the next three verses. It's going to be used five times in the next three verses because the writer is using this word to underscore the personal nature of what is about to happen. One day, Cain suggested to his brother, let's go out into the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother, Abel, and killed him. And so here you have humanity's very first homicide. And God, like an expert investigator, shows up on the scene and starts asking some questions. Look at verse 9. Verse 9 says, Afterward, the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother? Where is Abel? 
Now, God already knows the answer to these questions. Like any good investigator, he's giving his perp, he's giving Cain a chance to come clean. He's giving him an opportunity to confess what he did. But Cain, in this moment, comes across aloof and responds with deflection. Look what he says. He says, I don't know. Cain responded, am I my brother's guardian? Am I my brother's keeper? Now, God wasn't pleased with Cain's somewhat snarky response here because it was obvious Cain had no idea the significance of what he had just done. So in one last attempt, God tries to paint a shockingly uh, accurate picture of the destruction and devastation that, that he has inflicted, not just on his family, but on all of humanity as well. God laments in verse 10 when he said, what have you done? What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. But God's warnings in this moment, God's wake-up call didn't connect with Cain. He was completely clueless, clueless about the impact of his actions. And as a result, he took a huge chunk out of humanity, both metaphorically and literally. Why did God include this incident in his story? Like as humanity, why is this part a significant part of our origin story? Why is it in there? I mean, this is not only a tragedy for humanity, it's also a PR nightmare for what God is trying to get going on the earth. Why is it in there? I mean, what is... What is it supposed to be teaching us? What are we supposed to take from this? Well, what I I think God is trying to do here in the story of Cain and Abel is similar to what my driver's ed teacher did for me nearly 30 years ago now. Uh, As we were nearing the end of our instruction, uh, he came in uh, to teach us a, a module on drunk driving. And instead of telling us how bad drunk driving is, which is something that we already knew, he turned the lights down. He pulled out one of these things and put it on a desk, turned out the light, let it warm up a little bit, and then proceeded to show us a film containing images from dozens and dozens of driving collisions. I'll never forget it. I mean, we saw images of crumpled up cars, mangled motorcycle frames, glass and plastic shattered and scattered all over accident scenes. Just horrible, horrible things. And I don't know if they do this anymore. I sort of think it's probably not legal to show kids this. But it was, and we did it. And I think the purpose of this Driver's Ed moment was specifically designed to rock and shock our little adolescent imaginations. In an attempt to deter us from ever driving drunk, they used this scared straight strategy to shock us, to, to, to evoke emotions within us, to, to wreck us before we wrecked other people or ourselves. They, they did it this way to wake us up to what could happen if we were willing to act out in this way. And I think that this is exactly what God's attempting to do in this story. In fact, the the Bible actually gives us a name for what just happened in Genesis chapter 4, the the pathway that, that Cain took with God. There's a name for it. You may not know this. In the book of Jude, which is just one chapter right at the end of the Bible, there's a word that's used to describe what this is, this path from Cain's horticultural ambitions to his homicidal intentions. There's a name for it. This descent into depravity is called the way of Cain, the way of Cain. See, the way of Cain is an extreme example of what can happen when we don't give God what he really wants from us, the the thing that he's really after with us, which, by the way, is not to get you to come to church 
more often. It's not to get your money. It's not for you to jump through religious hoops and rituals. It's not for you to become a good person, a moral person, a good citizen. It's not even for you to be perfect. That's not what God wants from you. That's not what he really wants from you. What God really wants from you is your open heart to him. That's what he really wants from you. What he really wants is for you to be open and honest with him about who you really are. Who you really are. That when you come to him, you don't pretend. You don't put on airs. You don't try to be something that you're not. What he really wants from you is your authenticity to be before him with an open heart. And if you refuse to open your heart to him, he says it's like sin that is crouching at the door of your life that's, that's eager to control you. That that pretending before God will eventually start taking over in every area of your life. Well, James, does that mean that that I'm going to kill somebody like Cain? Probably not. Probably not. But when you close down your heart to God, there will always be some sort of death in your life. When you pretend before God, when you don't give him your open heart, there's always some sort of collateral damage that follows. That openness before him is what opens the door to the new life that he talks about. Everything else, the pretending, affects all your relationships. It affects your perception of yourself. It, it affects every aspect of your life. But when you open your heart to him, it changes everything. And that's what he wants from you. And that's what he wants for you. And that's why this way of Cain in Genesis 4 is supposed to be a wake-up call for us for what can happen if we don't open our hearts to God and allow him to help us deal with the junk that is on the inside of us, to open it up so that he can deal with the sin that is on the inside of us. See, what God really wants from you is for you to open your heart and let him see what's, what's inside. And, and for some of you, it's opening your heart to him maybe for the very first time. For you, maybe it's, for the very first time, turning the leadership of your life over to him, to accepting the salvation and the forgiveness that he offers you and receiving the grace that he wants to give you, allowing him to enter into your heart and begin to change you from the inside out for now and for eternity as well. And some of you need to do that today. I would encourage you, before the day is done, before this service is done, to talk to God about that and to invite him into your heart. Some of us, though, others of us, it is opening our heart up to God and being honest about the sin that is crouching at our door, about the way in our life in which we've embra been embracing the way of Cain. And I say this to you as a pastor who serves you that some of you are on the brink of making a decision that, that isn't an overnight change, but it's been in the making for quite some time. That there are things that you've allowed into your life that you know should not be there. And as a result, they are beginning to affect and infect every other area of your existence. And so I want to give you some space this morning to talk to God about that, to be real with him, to offer him your open heart and allow him to see what is inside. Let's pray. God, we give you this moment. God, and I pray for those that are here today watching online as well that if they have never opened their heart to you before, that today would be the day of their salvation. That they would open their heart to your grace and love and forgiveness. 
and that they would begin a relationship with you that starts now but lasts into eternity. And God, I also pray for others of us as well who have allowed sin to sneak up and stand right outside of our door. That the things that we have participated in or flirted with or engaged with, have seen, have said, God, we've allowed those things in. And those things, God, are not just going to stay outside the door. They're wanting to control us. And so, God, I pray that we would have the courage to open our heart to you today. That we would lay before you our lives, not as we think you want them to be, but, God, as they are. And so, God, we open this time, this space We give you our hearts. We open our hearts to you. And God, our prayer is that what we see and sing and say next could and would be our prayer to you today. And all God's people said,